safe space where healing might take place where everyone is valued. Giving tools to maintain where equity matters. Less talk, more action, where anyone is welcome. Don't send them home packing, it's your strong talk. When conversation pops off, speak life, reflect hope, promote choice and love, folk. Strong talk, real talk, no jokes, recovery, culture, community. Let's go. Yeah, what's the word? What's the word? Word, word, strong talk, strong talk. What's the word? What's the word? What's the word? Yeah, yeah. What's the word? Strong talk, strong talk. Hello and welcome to Strong Talk, a podcast dedicated to the discussion of equity, diversity, and family as it relates to mental health and addictions. I'm your host, Vic Armstrong, and I want to thank all of you for joining me on this journey. We started podcast, started this podcast because we believe that we are at a pivotal point as it pertains to access to mental health services, especially for historically marginalized communities. We want to create a space not only to talk about the challenges but also to explore and create space for solutions. Uh, but I'm joined today for this first episode by my friend, David Covington. He is a suicide prevention advocate, behavioral health champion, and he is the CEO and president of RI International. So David, welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Vic, and uh, excited to be part of this inaugural Strong Talk. Thank you so much. And you know, we know one of the reasons that, that I was, was really uh, um, excited about having you on today is because you have really been one of the um, one of the, the folks that's been instrumental in a lot of the changes that have come about of late uh, regarding access to crisis services. And specifically, I'm talking about uh, 988. Can you talk a little bit about um, what 988 is? I know a lot of folks have heard about it and may think they know what it is. Can you talk about what it is? Where, how did it come about and why is it so significant? Yeah. So, you know, I looked up the Atlanta phone book in 1966. It was the year I was born, Vic. And uh, if you looked at the very first page on the inside, that didn't have anything to do with a mental health crisis or substance use or suicidal crisis, Mm -hmm. but it had this giant exclamation point and it said emergencies. Mm -hmm. It had fire and medical and police, and then it had no numbers. But if you look at the upper top right, it said, okay, you need to do a little research. We've got a bunch of numbers down here, call around, figure it out, and then write that number in, rip this page out, tape it to your refrigerator and have your emergency in your kitchen. But Mm. that was back when there was no coordination. There was no thoughtful way. And we lost lives because we weren't fast enough to the fire, to the car accident, to the, uh, the public safety threat, et cetera. And uh, in 1966, a report came out and said, let's bring this together in 911. And so calling through all of these different numbers and trying to work your way through a maze uh, uh, cleared up. Um, And it's taken us 50 years, uh, but now we're saying we should do the exact same thing. And uh, Senator Orrin Hatch from Utah and a group of leaders there said, let's do a singular simple number. And there's a lot of discussion of what that number should be. Should it be 611 or, or, or some other number uh, like like in the family of 911 and 411 or 211. And uh, the head of the FCC at the time, Ajit Pai, he said this number should start with a nine. Mm-hmm. Just like 911. That signifies it's an emergency. And so 988 was born. It happened to be an available number. You know, we've got area codes, so you've got to have a number that's free. And 988, he thought, the FCC thought, would be that singular number that people could call if they're in a mental health crisis, a substance use emergency, or a suicidal crisis, and coordinate all this in the same way that we brought that together. The public knows to call 911, and now they're starting to learn to call 988. So why why do we need a different number though? Why 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 was nine one one not sufficient for people experiencing mental health emergencies? So we don't have a dedicated behavioral health emergency psychiatric response in the United States. Mm-hmm. We have uh, some random acts of service, uh, some well meaning and 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 in most cases great services that touch a very few people. Right. But from the average person who has an emergency that's psychiatric in nature, 
um, they are going to be detained in a hospital emergency department for hours or days. And it's extraordinarily common that the response to your mental health emergency is a police car in your driveway. Mm. Now, now your worst day of the year or the worst day of your life is not just the worst day because of the grief or loss or pain or psychosis or whatever the, the emergency is that was to start. Now it's compounded. Now you're worried about what my neighbors think, what my mm. landlord thinks, what my employer thinks because there are lights, one or two cars in the driveway and uniformed and armed uh, public safety officers, law enforcement are coming to my door. And the questions are, did I commit a crime? Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, am I a danger? When in fact, what was happening was I was struggling with a mental health emergency. So what we've done, I think, you know, we've, we've created a huge workaround, Vic. Uh, in in uh, 2005, we had thousands and thousands of individuals evacuated from uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, that we housed in large football stadiums. We did that because it was an emergency and we didn't have anything else. Right. Uh, that's what we've done with behavioral health crises. We, we don't have anything else. So we push them to the law enforcement and emergency medical response and hospital mm -hmm. emergency department system who are not trained or equipped or financed uh, to do that work. And they have a mission in place. So 911 is a dispatch service that's going to send, they're going to roll wheels. Those wheels are going to be an ambulance or, or a cop. What 988 is going to do is it's not starting with sending someone out. It's starting mm -hmm. with a caring, empathic, uh, trained voice. In, in some cases, lived experiences behind that call yeah. of a person who's been there themselves, who's providing support. That's going to be enough for a lot of people and why we needed a separate number yeah. for those mental health and substance use emergencies. So, um, so 9 8 has rolled out, uh, rolled out during the summer. How did we get there from, from the, from the, the, the original inception of this 9 8 number, this, this, this designated number, how did we get from there to an actual rollout? Yeah. So, you know, we've had crisis lines across the country for, for 55, 60 years now. And uh, we determined that uh, the Congress passed a law, President Trump signed it, uh, uh, and it became that we were going to have a three digit number. And the FCC determined that number would be 988. SAMHSA and the Veterans Administration put forth reports for how we might see this through. But at the time, uh, it was a concept. And then a host of individuals across the country from state and federal, it's the most significant state and federal partnership I've seen in my career. Uh, it's a dream, really. It's the first time we've seen this focus that crisis is not around suicide prevention. It's around suicide, mental health, substance use, even intellectual and developmental, uh, developmental disorders. Um, and it's, it's bringing together uh, an approach that is not just a phone call, but when additional resources are needed, uh, we don't need to use cops or, or ambulances because mobile crisis teams or even crisis receiving facility services are available. So a host of individuals started coming together, a national learning community, uh, the leadership of SAMHSA, uh, Vibrant, uh, uh, NASHBIT, of uh, the state uh, mental health commissioners, they all came together and we have step by step uh, pushed this forward. And then Congress said, states should finance this in the way that they support 911. So we've seen a number of states begin to do that. So it's been this step-by-step, -step, mm -hmm. but we've gone from a scenario where it was a patchwork set of crisis centers across the country, bringing whatever resources they had locally to the table to what is becoming a robust and ambitious national collective to ensure that we're there for anyone, anywhere, yeah. anytime. And I know that as, as, as with anything, when, we, when we're trying to roll out something this big on a national level, it's going to look different in different places. Uh, different states may have different resources available to them. There may be at different stages of support uh, in, their, in their local communities. And, and then also from, from, a, uh, from a state level, um, having those resources. Um, so what kind of things do we have in place uh, for sharing of information to make sure that we are looking at best practices and how do we 
Um, how do we um, spread those best practices across states, across different uh, different areas? Um, what are we doing in that space? You know, I think, Vic, again, the, the analog here of the emergency medical system is a strong one for us. In the 50s and 60s, there wasn't ambulance service to speak of. People were transported to the hospital in, in terrible uh, medical emergencies in the back of a coroner's uh, van, in a hearse, in a police car, in a family member's car, uh, and, and hospital emergency departments you couldn't even get in. Uh, there was a paper that came out in 66 that laid out a simple, straightforward way of developing what has become the response system that starts with 911 that we see today. And the SAMHSA National Guidelines for Behavioral Health Crisis Care have done the same thing in laying out this simple someone to call, someone to come if additional resources needed, and a safe place to go, a safe place to be. Um, yeah. and, and then wrapped around that, we now have this weekly national learning community in what we've affectionately termed the crisis jam. Uh, we had uh, over 400 national leaders and state leaders come together last week for a special youth edition, looking at a, uh, how those national guidelines apply to children and adolescents. Uh, and, and, and those um, programs are now available on YouTube. And, and, but we're seeing uh, a real uh, growing uh, collective impact, if you will, yeah. of people coming to the table and sharing and we've got a framework and then customizing to your point in yeah. local communities. Yeah, you know, I, I've had an opportunity to, to participate in some of those crisis jams. And one of the things I think that um, really, really resonates with me, part of it is, as you just talked about, is, is bringing up different people, different voices to the table. So you have not only the major architects of the system, but you also have people involved who are going to be the end users of the system, people who are advocates. Um, and one of the things that um, that I have been really most interested in is looking at how um, or what opportunities exist to really increase equity and access for historically marginalized communities. Um, I think that one of the things that has always been a challenge um, for people, especially in black and brown communities, um, is access. And uh, not having access to services in the communities where people live, uh, work, and, and play and pray. Um, we know that statistically, Black people in particular are much more likely, 20% more likely, in fact, uh, to report psychological stressors, but less likely to, to initiate services, more likely to access services in the emergency department, more likely to end up in the back of a police car in the, in the, in the midst of a mental health emergency. Um, so one of the things I'm excited about with 988 is the opportunity to really look at it and, and, and reimagine how we can create access in historically marginalized communities. And that's one of the things that I've really been um, pleased to hear um, a lot of conversation revolving around that. Um, can you talk a little bit about, from your perspective, as someone who's been uh, working in this crisis space for a long time, why, why does equity even matter? Um, why is it Why is it that uh, just creating more uh, doesn't create more access for everybody. Yeah. So uh, equity matters. Vic, voice matters. Voice is transformative. Um, mm -hmm. And we're, we're talking about black and brown communities. We're also talking about the voice of lived experience of people with mental health and Absolutely. substance use issues who feel suicidal, who are also black and brown individuals. Uh, yeah, and, and, and systems have been designed and deployed without any recognition of their voices. Until the late 90s, there were no voices at all mm -hmm. in the national dialogue of suicide prevention for people who'd been there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It did not exist at all. And I remember in uh, 2010, I was leading an effort with others at Magellan Health in Phoenix, and mm -hmm. we had this vibrant involvement of people with lived experience at the table. And I was at this conference and uh, there was this dynamic speaker, his name was Phil Pangrazio, and he led what used to be called the Disability Empowerment Center. It's now called Ability360. Mm -hmm. uh, and Phil was uh, uh, mobile through a wheelchair. Uh, 
And I was really inspired by his talk. So I went up to him afterward, talked to him about what we were doing and how uh, people were at the table sharing their experience and helping us shape. And Vic, I thought, I looked at his face and I thought he might spit. Hmm. It was not the reaction uh, I was expecting at all. I thought I'd get a pat on the back. And he explained, he said, that, that's tokenism. Hmm. He said, in the, in the disability field, we don't get invited to the table. We run the tables. Hmm. We're the CEOs, we're the chairs of the board. And let me explain to you why that matters and how that matters, how it impacts my ability to move legislators, how it impacts my ability to hold my peers accountable, uh, to be their fullest selves. And that was a really uh, eye-opening experience for me. Yeah. And then I come over to RI, to Recovery Innovations, uh, now mm -hmm. RI International, an organization with more than 50% of its staff are people who may have been in the back of that police car and it changes everything Vic when those individuals are part of the whole mix uh, we changed our language from patient consult consumer uh, to guest uh, we have adopted more of a retreat mentality mm -hmm. than a hospital unit and began to think about how we can uh, reduce and eliminate seclusion and restraint these uh emphasis is are always there to some slight degree but mm -hmm. when you when the room is 30 40 50 percent individuals with that living experience you get something different uh and i was really i tell you when when uh george floyd was murdered i remember thinking and we, we wrote a letter to the company i wrote a letter trying to be supportive uh, about that, uh, uh, what, what was su such a horrific uh, experience for, for so many Americans. And I remembered at the time uh, grieving, uh, uh, just almost weeping when Philando Castillo was, was mm. killed. Uh, you met, he had uh, been asked to produce an ID, reached into the, uh, the, the middle console and was shot and killed. And his wife then began videoing it and she didn't video the physical impact, she, but you saw the, just the uh, shock and, and disbelief and enormous grief. Uh, and so I remember at the time feeling that um, uh, being with the uh, black community and being supportive and, 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 and connecting. But again, that's a different experience. Then George Floyd is murdered and um i remember oprah had this um uh, uh special on and there was it was during COVID, so there were these 10 pictures on the screen and all 10 pictures were uh, uh african-american individuals sharing their experience one of them was charles blow and he'd just written a new york times editorial where he described uh the experience he called it an ambient gnawing violence Hmm. that black Americans go through. And it's the first time I realized I had experienced grief, hmm. but not fear. Yeah. Not an yeah. ambient gnawing violence. That's a totally. And, yeah. yeah. And as I'm looking at this screen of these 10 individuals, I'm realizing that's what we've done in the behavioral health space. We've had the 10 faces. It's the, it's the special on Oprah, but it's 10 white individuals talking. We've had yeah. clinicians, psychologists, family members, and so this voice, it's the whole thing, Vic, of getting a, 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 um, a new dynamic where the individuals who are experiencing this, and then that, that begins to push us to the next level, which is those individuals were always at the table, people with experiences, yeah. but we yeah. weren't safe to share them. Yeah, you bring up a, a couple of really, really valid points though, I think, because one, um, when you talk about um, people with, different abilities. We often, when we talk about equity, we, we think in terms of race and ethnicity. We forget that there are people who are deaf and hard of hearing. We forget right. that there are people who are um, you know, maybe in a wheelchair. They need to access services too. There's the intersectionality of, um, of mental health challenges. Um, and the system that we were, have, that we have historically operated on, but it wasn't designed um, to, to specifically meet those, those needs either. Um, the yeah, other and, thing- and Vic, that's where you get, I think, at the heart of, of this. If you look at the disability movement, 
Uh, mm -hmm. It mirrored the civil rights movement in so many different ways, uh, from peaceful protest. Uh, but their approach was never, there is something wrong with me. Right. You may be blind, you may be deaf or hard of hearing, you may be in a wheelchair, but they're not ever saying there's a fault with me. They're saying the fault is with society. It's yeah. not that I can't work or don't want to work. It's that you haven't cut the curb. You haven't made the elevator so that I can get inside. You haven't made where there's a restroom I can use during the day. Those yeah. are uh, the responsibilities of society. And I think there's a lot for us to learn from, uh, but that perspective comes only when you have those lived experience voices in dominant numbers at the table. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, because we also know that according to the last the last stats I've seen from the the, the Washington Post uh, police shooting database that really keeps um, track of um, all the stats on people who die um, at the hands of law enforcement. About twenty three percent of the folks that die at the hands of law enforcement have a diagnosable mental illness, uh, and, and which implies that in large part these are people that uh, probably really should not have had those encounters with law enforcement in the first place. But we didn't have another system. Yeah, uh, and now we, did, we, have, we didn't well, have another system, Vic. So yeah. Major Sam Cochran, Ra Randy Dupont were the two pioneers behind the CIT program out of Memphis. Yeah. After a black man was with with mental health challenges was shot and killed by police in the eighties, mm -hmm. uh, and they came forward and said, "We uh, in law enforcement need a dedicated system," um, and they had a bold vision of that, and it just never happened. It's, it's never yeah. happened. And we're 988 is the first time there seems like a material opportunity. Not only is it going to happen, it is beginning to happen. We're seeing communities put those resources in place so that we're not left uh, with the, the, the conundrum of being very concerned about somebody who may be suicidal, mm -hmm. uh, having other resources in place to bring to bear. Uh, it sounds like you're really struggling. Can I send a police officer to your door? Yeah, no, thank you. Can I send uh, 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 two individuals that are going to come in an unmarked car uh, and come up as two old friends, uh, a, a counselor, a peer, a social worker who are going to come in and sit down and problem solve with you? I might be open to that. Uh, that That's emerging finally. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it's been fascinating to me too because I've, I've, I've sat... Uh, had the opportunity to sit and talk with um, a lot of the folks who are leading the work in this space, whether it's you know SAMHSA or um, you know, NASPIT or different different organizations around the country. And I think one of the things that um, that we're all in agreement about is that the current system that we have is not a system that was built on and based on equity. Uh, we're not there, but there's also a consensus that we need to get there. And so I'm really, really um, encouraged by the conversation that's taking place around how we reach out differently, uh, both to people who have lived experience, but also people who have lived experience that represent historically marginalized populations, historically marginalized communities. And we recognize that it's there's no shortcut to getting there. It, it's going to take bringing people to the table. Um, it's really going to take acknowledging some of the things that we have historically done that have caused more harm than good. Uh, but then working together to figure out how do we create a better path forward. And I feel like that's the path that we're on. Is that the sense that you get in the work that we're doing now around 988? Yeah, ab absolutely, Vic. But we, you're hitting on the, the heart of we have a culture in the United States where, in fact, we punish individuals who reach out for help. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we, we believe uh, systems are not broken. They are perfectly designed to achieve what we as a culture want them to achieve. And 988 has now given us an opportunity to have a discussion and to think about a different approach where compassion and care and effective treatment that makes a difference is actually going to, to rule the day. And uh, none of us are naive. Those forces that have created a system in which law enforcement and hospital and doctor professionals, physician professionals are the front line. Th those forces are still in place, but I think we're finally having a real dialogue that a suicidal crisis, a mental health crisis, a substance crisis can happen to any one of us and does yeah. happen to any one of us. This isn't the, uh, the, the territory of people with serious mental illness or, or very significant substance use issues. Of course, those individuals have crises, but all of us 
have crises, just like all of us have medical crises. And, yeah. and so we're acknowledging that and we're beginning to move that forward and grapple with the way that we've provided care that didn't feel like care to yeah. the individual. Uh, for, yeah. for all it does feel like um, coming out of the, well, I shouldn't say coming out of the pandemic, but, but what we've experienced with the pandemic, because I know in large part, we're still dealing with, um, with COVID. But there is much more of a willingness, I think, um, for the general public to acknowledge mental health challenges, because I think I think for a lot of us, we we see ourselves differently now in terms of that uh, that mental health spectrum than we did prior to um, COVID nineteen, with all the fear and uncertainty it caused, and and seeing the spike in depression and anxiety. Um, so it just feels like the timing is right to really push forward. Uh, we have we have the ear of legislators. Um, you know, we have the ear of, of private funders who who recognize that we have mental health challenges in this state and, or in this country, um, and that now is the time to address them. It's an explosion, right? I mean, states were beginning to uh, realize that there were cost savings, there were human impact benefits, uh, there were uh, public safety concerns. Uh, so states were moving on this, but then 2020 happened, and just as you mentioned, Vic. Uh, the COVID pressure on not only society, but on hospitals in particular. Uh, the yeah. discussions of race and ethnicity and equity that came out of uh, George Floyd's murder, that reckoning. And then this galvanizing power of 988, not only pulled together this collective impact and this momentum, but it, it, it created the platform for so many voices like your own, Vic, mm -hmm. Uh, but hundreds of individuals now pressing forward and it's just starting to snowball yeah, uh, that this yeah. is the right thing to do. And, and look, it's the same thing that happened in the 60s, the 70s and the 80s. As we said, it's a horrible thing that you're better off being in a Jeep accident on the war front in Vietnam than you are in being a car accident mm -hmm. in, on the streets of Birmingham because there's no medical apparatus. There was on the war front. Yeah, uh, And we changed that. It, it took us a, a long time to do it, but we did that. And I think the speed with which we're moving right now um, is, is far superior to that. We're learning from that. It's a different era. And you're seeing this really transform right before our eyes. So if there were, um, if there were anything that you could say to, to people who are looking at this and saying, uh, either I'm not sure about this 98 thing, um, or people who want to know what can I do to help to to support um, this this movement that's taking place? What would you say to someone like that? I, I would say it makes a difference. Uh, you know, it's only been I remember 20 years ago when even suicide prevention experts didn't buy into the call center piece. Mm -hmm. uh, they they were commonly uh, held ideas that um, uh, lonely people called the lines. A person in a real psychiatric emergency just would kill themselves, not call someone. Right. And Madeline Gould and a host of other researchers began to s listen in on the calls, silently monitor with consent uh, and, and, and determine what is happening. And after thousands and thousands of those, uh, we, for those of us who answered the calls ourselves, uh, began to see that the research showed that not only were people, men and women, in extraordinary distress calling these lines, but they were being helped and impacted and lives were being saved continuously. And, and also that there was a lot of opportunity to improve and standardize uh, right. and bring more medical and clinical and living experience to the supervision of all that work. And over the last 20 years, we've seen all of that progress and, and develop and move forward and become a much more powerful product than even it was in 2000. And we're now starting to see resources deployed in communities across the country. Uh, in the state of Georgia, we have mobile crisis that's available in every community, which mm -hmm. means law enforcement is not being sent out. Uh, when it's not a public safety threat. It's not a an overt criminal activity being uh, uh, engaged. So that means thousands of times someone's experience on that worst day of the year is one of support and care 
even love and best practice and, yeah. and effective uh, treatment happening. So I, I would say that it's, you know, we are, we still have a lot of work to do, Vic, but there's mammoth progress that's been made and uh, engaging in this is going to help us keep that moving forward. Yeah. So w what needs to happen in terms of, um, you know, we, we have a system before that was, you know, we, we got what we paid for. Um, so how do we fund it differently now going forward? What needs to change there so that uh, for someone who um, who does need the services of a crisis receiving center where they can go in and be treated um, um, in a trauma informed manner where some people understand it, where they can talk to someone with lived experience? Yeah. Um, how how readily available is that across the country and what do we need to do to make sure that the resources are there to fund that kind of care? Yeah. So, you know, our learning community uh, in that crisis jam we talked about earlier is discussing this topic every every single week. And um, and the resources are there at talk.crisisnow.com, as well as a calculator that looks at what is the cost of these services to build them out in counties and states across the country. But Vic, for me, the most powerful next step, and it's what SAMHSA has laid out in a series of horizons. Their first horizon was to ensure that we're in fact available and responding in a timely fashion to everyone who's calling, texting, or chatting into 988. And it, it's, it's not perfect, but it is a strong start since July uh, um, 16th when, when this went, when yeah. went live. Yeah. Uh, the next horizon is to have mobile crisis teams available. And again, these are teams, uh, a, a person with lived experience, a social worker or a counselor, a team of two who's going out to where that individual is, to the kitchen table, to the apartment, uh, under a bridge, if, if the individual's homeless on the street, into a social service organization, a school, et cetera. And they're, they're sitting down and partnering together and collaborating and engaging and working through issues. That is by far and away, in the absence of that, that's where we're seeing law enforcement involved and having uh, this more punitive sort of impact. And we're seeing communities everywhere begin to um, uh, deploy those services in significant ways. I guess, David Covington, we look forward to many more conversations with you here um, at Strong Talk. Success with 988, as with any public health intervention, should be measured by how we serve the most vulnerable among us. Equity data priorities must focus on quantifying disparities in access and service delivery while recognizing and acknowledging longstanding inequities. Our evaluation efforts cannot be limited to measuring the impact on the health of a whole population. Our interventions and our message should in fact be informed by multiple rounds of market research that oversample for historically marginalized and underserved communities. We have a responsibility to set an expectation that resources allocated for 988 and for expanding mental health resources will be utilized to serve populations that reflect their community's demographics and utilize these data as part of a feedback loop along with technical assistance to continually push forward equity and accountability. A successful data strategy will identify the underlying social inequities and the resources needed to afford all impacted individuals a fair and just opportunity to achieve their healthiest outcome. 988 represents a long past due opportunity to shift from a law enforcement and justice system response to one of immediately connecting to care for individuals in suicidal, mental health, and substance use crisis. This represents an opportunity to make a fundamental shift in how people in crisis all people in crisis are engaged in our communities. And that is Strong Talk. What's the word? What's the word? Word, word, strong talk, strong talk. What's the word? What's the word? What's the word? Yeah, yeah. What's the word? Strong talk, strong talk.